We're going to start the board meeting here in a couple minutes. It's 8 o'clock. We need a couple more minutes to get ready, and we'll be starting in a couple minutes. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and call the Spiny Dogfish and Coastal Sharks Management Board meeting to order. Um, early start this morning, and I'm sure for some people an enjoyable late night as well. Uh, so we'll do what we can our last day here in St. Simons this morning. Uh, I'm Adam Nawalski. I'm the vice chair of the board sitting in uh, for Mark Gibson, who's not with us here this week. Um, we'll start out with a uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda, and I'll ask if anyone has any other items to add to the agenda and under other business. Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as it appears? Bill Adler, a second to that motion by Bob Ballou. Is there any opposition to that? Seeing none, the agenda is approved as written. Our second item of business here this morning will be to approve the proceedings from the August 8th board meeting. Uh, do I have a motion for that? Motion made again by Mr. Adler. A second to the motion. Mr. Himchak, is there any opposition to the approval of the proceedings? Seeing none, those proceedings are hereby approved. Our next order of business will be to turn to the public for comment on any items that are not on the agenda. We don't have anyone signed up. Do I have any hands from the audience this morning? Seeing none, we'll continue moving along. Our next order of business this morning will be to go back and reconsider the 2014-15 spiny dogfish specifications after a change made by the Mid-Atlantic Council. And for that, we're going to turn to Katie Drew for a presentation on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Paul Rago could not come down, um, as I'm sure you all understand why, for this meeting, so I will be giving the um, update on the spawning stock biomass status and reference points. So I'm just going to go over sort of the existing management measures, the stock conditions, the ABC update, and recommendations and council action. Um, So existing management, just to remind everybody, 2014 is year two of a three-year spec setting process. Um, the ACL is a 55,277,000 pounds with a commercial quota of 41,784,000 pounds and a trip limit of 4,000 pounds. So 2015 is going to be year three of three with an ACL of 55,063,000 pounds and a commercial quota of 41,578,000 41, pounds and it's still the same trip limit of 4,000 pounds. Stock status from a recent update is uh, overfishing is not occurring and the stock is not overfished. F in 2012 was approximately 0.149, which is definitely below the FMSY of 0.24. And the biomass in 2013 was approximately 200,000 metric tons um, above the biomass target or BMSY of 159,000 metric tons. So this is just a graph to show you sort of recent trends in spawning stock biomass. You can see that dip that we all know about and then the recovery of the stock. Um, in recent years, so if we go to the next slide, um, this is the sort of the, the estimate with uncertainty around it, so from the stochastic model, and you can see that the, the probability of being below that, uh, the threshold and the target are very low. Um, spawning, <coughs> excuse me, fishing mortality on the female has relatively low in recent years, um, maybe a slight uptick at the end, but definitely down from the peak during the decline, and the um, Probability, they don't have the reference points on this slide, but the probability of being below the, um, being above your F reference points is low. This is the recruitment index. As you can see, in recent years, we've had some fairly strong year classes. However, it's coming after a period of low recruitment, which is expected to work its way through the spawning stock population um, in the future, in the next several years. Um, these are the projections, which you can't read, but the point is we're taking the median of these, which is what's circled. Um, 
and basically the TC, the monitoring committee, the SSC recommended increased, increased quota in line with the um, increased ACL and AM. And so council action was taken where they moved to adopt um, a higher commercial quota, a higher, a higher ACL for 2014 and 2015, and that motion is um, pending approval by NOAA Fisheries. All right, uh, given that, thank you for that presentation. Any questions on the presentation? Uh, Rob, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Katie. I, I guess the, uh, that situation with the uh, poor recruitment, when I looked at the assessment document, um, it seemed like it's not going to work its way through at all. I think we've been waiting for a downturn and to have quotas downturn as well. And the explanation that I saw was that the exploitation rates during the, for those year classes, those poor year classes was low enough, and I guess the longevity is long enough that it smoothed over any type of expected transition and the subsequent year classes um, following the, the poor string from, I guess, 1998 to 2003 really has made this a, a stock that's pretty vibrant still. Um, so I, I, is that consistent with what you know? Yes, so when I say it's going to work its way through, what I mean is there's the projections indicate the biomass will dip a little bit, um, but it's definitely not, it's going to go maybe below its, its target, but it's definitely not going to crash the stock or anything to that extent. So it's, um, we may expect a small dip, but it should recover with the strong year classes in recent um, years. Wilson. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> Yeah, Rob, I was concerned about that too, and I, I talked to uh, Jim Armstrong about it. I guess I would still ask Katie, if, you know, as far as the age structure of the female SSB goes, are, are we seeing rebuilding in those, you know, older, more mature females? I mean, obviously it takes 20 years to grow a 20-year-old dogfish, but um, I had talked to Jim about, about the dip and whether or not by continuing to increase the quota we ran the risk of then having to decrease it in the future. And what he had indicated to me was that you know, there's a possible scenario that if the market was to explicitly reject exploitable size male dogfish and discards of males went up, then uh, overall landings might go down because then it would follow the female only trajectory and I, you know how likely that is I don't know but that that was the only scenario he could think of in which we might have to you know once again take a look at reducing the quota in order to rebuild that older age female biomass a comment on that the 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 length structure of the females does remain um I don't want to say truncated exactly, but the mean length of females is, is lower in current years than it def than, definitely than it has been in the past. Um, but I, it's, I don't think it's, a, it's necessarily a cause for concern, or at least it doesn't seem to be for the assessment. Um, and I think your, your point about targeting and, and the, more, the more pressure you put strictly on the females, obviously, the more of a concern we would have for the rebuilding of the stock. But I think that would... or the maintenance of the stock in its rebuilt condition. But I... Um... Follow up to that, Wilson? Yeah, and, and if you look at the recruitment, I mean, the recruitment has bounced back very well. So even though we may not be getting as many pups per female as we used to, I guess there's enough of them out there to, to have caused that to rebound very nicely. So maybe not a concern. And I believe mean pup size per female has remained stable, if not increased a tiny amount. So... Uh, had Pat next, and then Dan and Pete. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did the SSC uh, have any um, problems with this number? Uh, this number was in the range of what they thought the uh, council could approve, wasn't it? Do we know that? Yes, this is... Uh, the real question is, was it at the maximum of the range or at the median? I think it was at the median, wasn't it, uh, Mr. Chairman? I'll turn to staff who's giving me a yes. Excellent. When you're ready, I'll make, like to make a motion. 
Okay, we'll entertain a few more questions to the presentation before we get to that. Dan? Katie, isn't one of the reasons for this uh, smoothing out or, or lack of a dip um, the sort of expected um, uh, lack of discards? It, I believe a lot of the mortality in dogfish was not related to directed fishing, but bycatch and discards in, in trips that were either not targeting dogfish are not allowed to take uh, any significant amounts of dogfish. And I think a lot of those trips have, have gone away because of the situation with groundfish in, in New England. I think that that's part of it, yes. And I think um, basically just that, that any kind of amelioration of the fishing pressure is going gonna, is gonna to help the stock. And so in that respect, I think reducing those discards has helped. Pete? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, at the Mid-Atlantic Council, when we were debating the uh, the higher allowable biological quotas, um, I guess I used the word polite. We're being a little too polite with the species. And um, we went with the higher quotas after um, discussion of market, uh, market uh, if, if we're going to even reach the quota. But I think I think what I came down to, as far as my my concern, was that I mean we're, we're trying to promote new markets, and for that matter, it did not make sense to constrain an allowable biological catch, with which would be the higher quotas that the Mid Atlantic Council adopted for 2014-2015. Any other questions on the presentation? Bill Adler. Uh, this is more of a, just a comment on the on the dogfish thing. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that the Atlantic States can do about um, trying to help regain the market that was lost. And this is one of the reasons that the price was so low and nobody went fishing. Uh, because there just wasn't the market. The dealers didn't want it. And uh, they go, okay, we have a higher quota, whoopee ding. And, and they're happy about that for once a quota goes up. Uh, but there's no market. Uh, and I didn't know if the federal government or this agency can do anything about helping the market. Like in Europe, they don't want them anymore, which is the major place it went. And I don't know what can be done to help that because you raise the quota, that's great. But with the low price and the market not there, uh, they're just not going fishing. Tony has a response to that, Bill. Adam, we have been um, trying to provide some information with congressional staff on spiny dogfish to help them um, write some letters. Uh, for those board members that do not know, uh, I think we think a lot of the market loss is due to the European countries not allowing um, uh, shipments of dogfish due to high levels of PCBs, um, and they have a higher standard uh, than the U.S. does. But we have been um, trying to work with the congressional staff to get them the information that they need that we can provide for that. All right, so where we are then, uh, seeing no other questions, what's before us is to go ahead and reconsider a previous decision, uh, assuming we get a motion to that effect, which it sounds like, Pat, you're prepared to make. Um, I believe this is the motion that you were ready to make that Mike can put up here for us right now. And if you would just double check that, Pat, you can read it here to make sure that that was, in fact, uh, the correct motion you had. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I believe that's exactly the wording until a moment now when I change my mind. <laughs> would you like to read it, Pat? Or May would I like please, to read Mr. It? Chairman? Move to reconsider the option. Uh, hang, hang, hang on. I haven't one. finished uh, forming your motion yet. I did, but now they're changing it for me. You need the money, so stop. <laughs> Mike does a very good job of reading your mind for you. Are we done? Did we correct it? <laughs> it's adoption fund. That's okay. Now we have. That's we, the best now we have it. Thank you very much. They all seconded. I haven't read it. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Mr. Augustine's going to read it in, and then I'll go ahead and entertain a second to that. Thank motion. you. Move to reconsider the adoption of a spiny dogfish quota 
for 2014 an ACL slash AM of 60,695 million pounds resulting in a commercial quota of 49,037 million pounds and to adopt for spiny dogfish in 2015 an ACL slash AM of 62 um, Two, yeah, what is that? 62,270 million pounds, resulting in a commercial quota of 50,612 million pounds. Motion by me. And just to clarify that, that was 60.695 million 60 pounds. 60.95 million pounds. 49.037 million, million pounds. That's correct. Thank you. Okay, a second for that motion. Hands up over here. I had Mr. Bell Vance seconds that motion. Uh, Comments on the motion, and just a reminder for the board that we'll need a two-thirds vote for this. Comments, Pete? Yes, the, the discussion on the PCB issue was, was new to Spiny Dogfish at the Mid-Atlantic Council. And as, as, I, as it was explained, uh, the European Union uh, set a standard that's as near to zero as possible. Um, it would be somewhat real unrealistic in context with the any PCB standard that we set for any fish in the United States. So those issues were trying to be resolved. Um, November 1st uh, traditionally kicks in a big, a big harvesting season, at least in New Jersey. So um, uh, again, um, um, that's just background information on the PCB issue, but uh, yeah, we need new markets, whether it comes in the national park system, uh, state uh, institutions, um, the push is on to, to market these things, get them out of the water. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just following up on what Pete said, I had heard the same thing about the European Union uh, blocking imports. And I looked online, and is it a uh, blanket policy there? Because it looks like they've rejected specific shipments from what I can see, and they've actually tested for the uh, PCB levels. And all I could find was a couple of shipments rejected from Germany and Italy. So I was just curious whether you knew whether it was a applied to all EU countries or not. I'll go back to Pete for a response to that. Uh, it's my understanding that any PCBs detected were in the belly flaps, and the belly flaps typically go to the German beer gardens, whereas the meat goes to the uh, New England, uh, Great Britain uh, fish and chips market. Italy, I don't know. Another comment from staff. Um, since, since all the European countries are part of the EU, if they're rejected from one country, they would re be rejected from all the countries. Right. Does each country test? Yes. I, I was just curious about the process because it, what was listed is individual shipments being rejected, which would imply that other ones are being accepted because the shipments that they said were rejected recently were not huge, huge amounts. <laughs> I'm not sure what their process is. Okay, do we have any other comments on the motion before us? Okay, seeing none, uh, does the board need a moment to caucus? All right, seeing that the board is ready for the vote, again, that we need a two-thirds vote, and we do need to record this as a final action. Uh, I'll begin by asking if there's any opposition or abstentions to this action from the board. Mr. Himchak? Uh, Adam, I'm sorry, violating protocol here as your, your chair, but you said I could take liberties since you were... <laughs> No, I, I just... Uh, uh, for the record, I don't recall saying that. <laughs> I, I, uh, so the, yeah, this, this, you know, every year we, we go through three approval phases of this. We go through the Mid-Atlantic, the, the ASMFC, and the New England Council. Um, the New England Council doesn't uh, vote on this until, I'm not sure when, but it does, uh, what is the sentiment from anybody from New England on... It, or is there any discussion, premature discussion, on what they'd want to, want to do with spiny dogfish? I'll 
turn to the New England <laughs> Terry. Yeah, uh, Pete, the, uh, the, this isn't even on our agenda. Uh, we, we have a one-day meeting scheduled in, at the end of November, um, and, which is cram full, and a three-day meeting in, uh, scheduled in uh, December. So I'll work with the executive director to get this on the agenda. Okay, I'm going to shorten up that rope here moving forward since we were in the middle of taking a vote. Uh, what I saw, I saw no opposition from the board. I saw abstentions from the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Marine Fisheries Service and an abstention from Georgia as well. So seeing that with the motion before us, the motion will pass with those three abstentions, Georgia, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay, we will go ahead and move on then to our next agenda item. Uh, actually, before we go to that, Tony had some comments here for us on issues regarding cumulative trip limits she wanted to bring before the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was at the Mid-Atlantic Council, and while the council was reconsidering these specifications, they also were discussing trip limits. And there was um, a discussion to have cumulative trip limits. Uh, there had been some discussions of up to 20,000 pounds as well as at 12,000 pounds. Um, and so because uh, this board hadn't discussed cumulative trip limits and it was a new idea being brought forward, they decided not to take it on for this year but asked us to discuss them and then bring back our thoughts on using cumulative trip limits in the dogfish fishery for the future. Um, we have used cumulative trip limits in other species before like SCUP where the commission sets a weekly trip limit and NOAA Fisheries has set a daily possession limit. Um, I think it was the hope of the Mid-Atlantic Council that both bodies would have cumulative trip limits though. Um, and so, it, meaning that it would be a weekly possession limit that could be accumulated over time. And I think that they wanted to raise this trip limit to help avoid um, discards in the fishery. Tony, are you looking for any specific response from the board here today, or what, what would be needed, or is that just a point of information that you're looking for all the commissioners to go home and consider for future action? I was looking for the board's thoughts on using trip limits so I could take it back to the, um, the Mid-Atlantic Council as well as if uh, the New England Council does bring it up that we would have our thoughts on the use of cumulative trip limits. And they were talking about this for the, um, I, I believe for the northern region, not the southern states. All right, we'll take a few minutes. Uh, Tom O'Connell had his hand up. Yeah, I'm um, not opposed to the idea, but I'm um, curious in regards to law enforcement, the enforcement enforceability of monitoring the cumulative trip limit. Are they going to have access to data to understand where a fisherman is during the week? Tony? I did bring this up with law enforcement yesterday in anticipation of that question, um, and their thoughts have not changed since we um, did cumulative trip limits in SCUP, where they find that cumulative trip limits are very difficult to enforce because they don't have um, timely data to show whether or not a fisherman has already um, offloaded or not um, during that week, so they can't tell if they have surpassed that weekly trip limit or not um, by one one boarding. Dan? Yeah, one of the problems with uh, weekly trip limits is it might work more successfully for federally permitted vessels that are filling out VTRs properly. So as they steam out, the, the VTRs filled out. As they head back into port, the VTRs filled out. The VTRs in the wheelhouse and the officer can check the VTR to see what happened on this trip and in this week. Um, the problem with the nearshore fishery is uh, it's done by, uh, if it's done by a state waters only fisherman, uh, I don't believe any of the states, I know we don't in Massachusetts, have a comparable system that uh, creates that accountability. So maybe the, f the federal government could accommodate weekly trip limits 
and maybe the state fishery does without that. There is an advantage, however, to going with uh, larger trip limits, especially uh, if you consider the uh, predominance of males offshore, that if you want to uh, reduce discards and actually to start to target some of the smaller males, you probably have to do that further from shore. And it's, I, I serve on the monitoring committee and there's often conversation about uh, whether or not it would be appropriate to target offshore uh, 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 males in the offshore areas, but the trip limits are never high enough. So there might be some advantage there going forward. Tony, did you want to respond, or you you got that? Okay. Uh, Pat, then Doug, then Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Along with what Mr. McKernan is saying, there's no question that increasing the trip limit does uh, eliminate uh, discards, and I think that's part of the issue. As far as the law enforcement people are concerned, I think we've recently been paying an awful lot of good attention to them because they've been very on, much on target. And I think part of our role is to making sure that we make their job as simple as possible. And we have, we have good enforcement um, suggestions and recommendations. In this case, I think we should look at eliminating that weekly and go to the Mid-Atlantic and go for the higher quotas. I do think it would solve the problem uh, on both parts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Doug Grout. And uh, why wasn't just a, uh, instead of cumulative trip limits, why not just an increase in the daily uh, trip limit? Is that just not going to be high enough is that for offshore vessels? Is that the reason behind that? There's obviously an enforcement uh, issues with that. Um, so, Tony, perhaps you could take that back if you don't have an answer right now, but you can get some information about that. Uh, next on the list, I had Mike Petney. Thank you. Uh, just sort of uh, following on from Dan McKiernan's comments, um, from the NIF's perspective, we have always held that we cannot monitor, adequately monitor or enforce weekly or cumulative possession limits. So if you remembering back to, as Tony described, uh, the SCUP situation several years ago when the Commission did adopt weekly possession limits. We held we could not monitor or, or enforce those, so we adopted a complementary per trip possession limit equal to the weekly limit. Um, nothing has changed. We still feel that we could not uh, adequately monitor or enforce weekly possession limits. Rick Belvant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess I just wanted to offer maybe a, a flip opinion to the uh, federal trip limit, uh, cumulative trip limits, and not having them apply in state waters. Um, we saw pretty loud and clear in the winter flounder case that the state boats felt really disadvantaged by having a, a state quarter that was different than the federal quarter, and there was an inequity uh, argument there that I think we should probably think about as well. Um, in Rhode Island, we have a dogfish fishery right in state waters up against the federal waters and I could picture uh, some fishermen having hard feelings about seeing one boat be able to take in a, a cumulative trip and they can't. So I want to think of that a little bit. Richie? Tony, does that give uh, you some information that you were looking for? Oh, one more comment, Bob Blue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to note that Rhode Island has had excellent experience with regard to what we call our aggregate landings program, which, are, which is the same issue, same concept, for both SCUP and uh, summer flounder. Uh, monitoring through SAFIS, uh, enforcement through logbooks and VTRs, uh, we feel the program is working very well, and I think this could work just as well. Uh, thank you. Any other comments? Tony, looks like she's got some information. I appreciate the board comment on that, and she can take that information back. All right, our next order of business uh, will be to consider spiny dogfish FMP review and state compliance, and we'll turn to Marin for that presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is the 2013 spiny dogfish FMP review and state compliance. It's a very brief, brief presentation. So commercial harvest um, has increased with the increasing quota over the years since the development of the FMP in 2002. In 2012, the quota was 30 million pounds, and coastwide commercial landings were 27,900,000 uh, £27 pounds. These landings were comprised of 97% female, 
The recreational landings made up less than 1% of the total catch with about 42,000 pounds. And the discards were about 10.5 million pounds, which is uh, similar to previous year's discards. There are no specific surveys aimed at monitoring spiny dogfish. However, there were seven surveys that encountered spiny dogfish, but there were no trends that were apparent in these surveys, so not much information was gleaned from them. And the plan review team reviewed all state compliance reports, and all states' regulations were consistent with the FMP. I did just want to note that Table 9 in the FMP review that was distributed uh, with the board materials was incorrect. Massachusetts does have a finning prohibition. And the uh, PRT received four requests for de minimis, Delaware, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. All of those states meet the requirements, which is less than 1% of total landings. Connecticut and Maine also qualified, but they did not uh, request de minimis. The plan review team recommends granting all of these requests. And that's all I have. Thank you. Questions for Marin? Seeing none, do we have a motion to come before the board? Mr. Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well done, Marin. Uh, I move that the board accept the FMP review and state compliance and... Oh, why don't you read it, Joe? <laughs> <laughs> now, Pat, you do a wonderful job of bringing these to staff first so that we can move the board along. It, it is much appreciated. Thank you. That's why I'm here. We do have fun, don't we? By the way, I brought my friends with me and put them on the table. Some of you got that, most did. <laughs> Move to accept the 2013 Spiny Dogfish FMP review and state compliance and approve the minimum status for uh, Delaware, South Carolina, Florida, and Georgia. And that's my motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Second for the motion. Mr. Rhodes seconded the motion. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, is there any opposition to the motion? Abstentions? Null votes. Motion carries without opposition. All right, moving right along. Our next order of business will be to set the 2014 Coastal Shark specifications, and we'll turn to Carolyn Belcher for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know there's a presentation. I'm just not sure who's putting it up for me. Um, the TC reviewed uh, the draft specifications that HMS has put out. Sure. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, so I guess, hold on one sec. Yeah, let's go ahead and um, we'll pick up with, yeah. So the 2014 Coastal Shark Specs um, that the TC looked at at its September 27th meeting, um, they're still obviously in draft form. Finals won't be out until closer to the first of the year. Uh, the aspects that were kind of discussion points for our group was looking at how black nose is going to be handled with over harvesting. Um, and the idea being is that it will be spread out over um, the subsequent years to help lessen the impact to the fishermen as opposed to taking one big hit up front. Um, and then the discussion relative to the season start date of January 1st. Um, I know most of us are aware of the seasonality of these animals, so as we start earlier in the year because of cold water off of the mid-Atlantic, those states don't get the chance to fish to the degree that those southern states do, and as such, obviously, it impacts that equitability of catch um, up and down the coast. And Carol Brewster guys who's on our committee had noted that uh, they received many comments relative to that date. So we're still kind of in that draft stage. Uh, again, finals won't be out till closer to the first of the year, so there could be some discussion at that point. Um, next slide. I think. Yeah, that's all covered. Oh, wait, there was another point. Okay. Um, so as you can see, relative to quotas from 2013 to 2014, the only changes that are pretty obvious are the small coastal sharks um, group. There's an increase there. The black nose has a decrease to deal with the overfishing issues. And poor beagle is actually going to get some proposed quota this year as well. So those are the, the major changes that we see. Um, and again, this could change depending on um, whatever other comments NOAA gets or HMS gets on this subject. 
and that, that's for that point. All right, so where we are with this, uh, we'll first entertain questions on that brief presentation. Rob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, I know there's been some concern with the January 1 opening, and I don't know how to gauge just how much concern based on Carolyn's comments, but I know that I uh, talked to um, Lewis Daniel a few times and to Tony, and the situation is uh, that there can be a problem with little quota left by the time, for example, in Virginia, our closure stops, which is after July 15th, May 1 to July 15th. And I wasn't sure, haven't really followed up with Tony, as to whether all those comments, uh, you know, were placed in the response uh, on this issue. The other comment I have is the 80 percent seems a little conservative, uh, and I know that it's not being considered, but was there any discussion about the 80 percent uh, trigger for the closure? To my recollection, I, I don't remember that 80 percent discussion, um, but I do know, you know, again, past and present, the discussions about, we've, we've been through many changes with the season and opening and closing, and it always does come down to the same point, the January 1, because of that cold water precluding states. Um, the states do have that concern and will continue to voice that concern about that discon you know, the disconnect and how that affects the quota for the northern states. Um, but yeah, I can't tell you that specifically that 80 percent, it's just been more that fact again about the equitability of the northern states being able to catch their, their fair share of the quota. Pat? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, having been on the HMS uh, committee for a bunch of years when I was with, with the Mid-Atlantic, this issue kept coming up again and again and again. The problem was that um, those states that had access to the animals early on were literally wiping up uh, the quotas, and primarily the Gulf of Maine, uh, Gulf of Mexico, in that area. And so the concern would be, if we go back to January one, uh, what's to prevent that from happening? Unless uh, certain species are um, taken off of, put on a prohibited list for uh, the Gulf of Mexico. So I, quite frankly, from my experience, in it, I would not support. Uh, if we were to write a letter, I would not support going back to January 1. I know I've had some discussions with, uh, with a group, with the HMS group, and uh, I just think it's a bad idea. Again, we will go back uh, to that area where, well, first off, we now have limited shark fishermen, primarily because you either have to have an experimental permit or you're basically out of it. And, and that's been a hardship on a lot of the shark fishermen that I've known over the years. And, and now to go back to January 1 just compounds the problem even more. So I really don't think we should support this unless you have more clarification, Carolyn. To that point, I do know that there was a letter that was sent from ASMFC relative to that point on behalf of the board stressing that concern over the January 1. And the TC does, again, support that um, in the fact that because it is a seasonality issue for sure. Thank you. Rob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess just a, another question. Um, when would a seasonal quota uh, be able to be talked about? So, for example, you know, having it based on different seasons, is that something that's been in the, in the works? Under adaptive management in the FMP, uh, the board can consider that at any time. Thank you, Marin. Seeing no other questions on the presentation, what the action that would be before the board here today would be to potentially approve the 2014 specs. Uh, we do have the one hurdle, however, with regards to the fact that these specs may be changed in the not too distant future. So what the board may consider is drafting a motion that may be contingent upon those specifications changing moving forward. Pat? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make the motion after someone puts it up there for me so I don't have to wordsmith my own motion. <laughs> Can we, we're going to have to expand that motion, as the Chairman had suggested. Can we do that? We've got that coming. Give it just a moment. Thank you. I think that covered it, Mr. Chairman. Should I read it? Go ahead and read it. Move to approve the 2014 Coastal Shark Specification Conditional on NOAA Fisheries Final Rule. Thank you. Now, when we go ahead and say conditional, would that be enough information to, phrased like that, would that mean that we're not approving it until NOAA Fisheries approves it, or would that mean that we would change it when they changed it? It should be conditional on the fact they will change it and that we approve because we have been abiding by uh, similar or mirror type rules all these years. So Tony might have a better word. Perhaps contingent might be. Well, let, let me stop there for a minute. Let, let's start with this. Let's entertain a second to that, and then we'll work on wordsmithing it. Mr. Himchak seconds the motion before us. Okay, seeing that, maybe we can get some guidance from staff here on how to wordsmith this to achieve what we're trying to achieve. I guess my question to the board is, are you saying that you will automatically, you, that you want to automatically approve whatever NOAA Fisheries puts out, or is this specific to the start date? I, I believe that what we're looking to do is to approve what we saw before us today, and should those regulations be changed, our regulations would automatically change without them having to have to come back before the board. Is that correct, what the intent of your motion and second was? That's correct, and I do want to address the letter again if we need to, but we have already sent one letter. If it's important to split it out and send a second letter, uh, that would address the uh, concern about the January 1st start date. But you're absolutely right, Mr. Chairman. That addresses the issue. I, I believe the wording is fine, especially with having on the record what your intention is. Is there any other discussion with suggestions for changing it or with having that on the record about what our intentions are sufficient? Any other discussion on this matter? Okay. Uh, Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I know we don't have a time certain for the uh, National Marine Fishery Service uh, final rule. Um, is it necessary to go forward with this today? I mean, that'd be a question. Um, and if it is, then Virginia would have difficulty supporting that January 1, uh, 2014 opening. Marin? In the past, uh, NOAA Fisheries has come out with their final rule uh, usually about the second week of January. So that would be up to the board whether you want to proceed with this or not, given that information. And maybe Kelly has something to add. Just, just to clarify that we're targeting to try to have the final rule out in the beginning of December to form the board's decision making. So I, I think where we are is that if we don't take action here today, we wouldn't likely be taking action prior to February at that point. So that's really why this action is before us here today with the contingency slash condition about should these numbers be changed, they would just automatically be implemented through the board. Does that meet your needs? Rob? Um, without being able to see down the road on how adaptive management would work to provide some security to those states that could be um, left behind on this January 1 date, I think what's been provided is sufficient. There's still that question of taking that up later, I suppose. And what would meet 
your needs for later at a subsequent board meeting? Have staff getting back to you in the next couple of weeks? What what would you like to help meet the needs of your state? I sense some interest from other states that they would like to see uh, modifications to just having the quota uh, in a derby style, which can happen and has happened. And so perhaps looking at seasonal options so that there would be some quota still available um, later on in the second half of the year for states would be my preference. One of the options I could see with us moving forward after we take action on this would be to direct the PDT to look into that for us. I think that would be very good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other discussion on this motion? Pat? Yeah, clarification, Mr. Chairman. I'm assuming when we said spec, we were talking about the quota setting. We weren't talking about the January date. And... Um, if I think Mr. O'Reilly's concern is that by us doing this, we automatically accept the date, the January 1 date. That was not my intention. My intention was to accept the specs for the quotas that had been presented by Carolyn. And that the second part of it would be, um, as she iterated, we, um, we have already sent one letter saying we weren't happy with the January date. And um, even though there will be... Um, uh, an announcement, a final rule come out in December, I still think we need to have another separate piece of paper, another letter from the, the, the commission saying that we do not approve going to the January 1 date. Whether it takes any, gets any traction or not, I do think we have to go on record. It is going to have a negative effect on our fishermen, and, and Mr. O'Reilly is right on target with that. So. Uh, they may have uh, moved to the point where it's going to be a slam dunk and they're going to incorporate it, but I still think we need to go on record. It will have a deleterious effect on our fishermen. So as a separate motion or just a letter from you, Mr. Chairman, directed to the staff to uh, generate a, a letter to them saying we are not in favor of That's assuming that the rest of the board feels similar. I'll give Marin a chance to respond to that, and then we can decide if further action is needed on the part of the board. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to remind the board that um, the FMP indicates that you will not actively set quotas or opening and closing dates. So as of right now, the FMP dictates that we follow no fisheries openings and closures, whatever they decide. If you wanted to change that, it would require board action. So what we're doing is we are, when we say we're following this, specifications we are accepting the possession um, right the possession limits is what we're approving yes for the quotas the board. and the possession limits well basically just the possession, possession limits. limits and and to to remind the board that we we did send the letter when the comment period was open and Rob had asked if we had um, and Virginia also sent a letter in regard to the possession limits as well and we had did have conversations with HMS staff um, expressing our concerns with those start dates and the possession limits to make sure that there would be um, fish available throughout the season to that point mr. chairman please uh, I'll just add before we reiterate that then I I would just like some clarity then on the starting date do we have a date through this motion that would constrain our states to a specific date at this time yes but so in the proposed rule the date is January 1st but no fisheries has indicated that this date might change due to the public comments that they received on that rule is that public comment period still open whereby another letter could affect change or is there any what, what writing another letter at this point how could that impact the process if at all or or is it basically out of the hands of any additional input at this point do you Kelly and I hate to put you on the spot but That's any okay. input you could provide would be great Sure. Uh, so public comment period has closed. We're in the midst of final rulemaking. Um, obviously, if the board would like to send another letter, they're welcome to do that. Um, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, too late probably. 
but reiterating or reinforcing, certainly I recognize and I'm sitting here and I'm hearing what you're saying, um, and I can take that back uh, to HMS. Pat, did you have a further comment? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So based on that, whether we approve their, the specifications or not, um, the specifications will be implemented. And if we don't accept them and go along with them, we're going to be zigging and zagging, and we've been there, um, out of sync with no before. And uh, I think, well, with Scott in particular, with one of the species, but I just don't see us going down that way. I think at this point in time, it's a late date. It's too late. The game is almost over, and the uh, score is going to be put up in the first part of December. So I would still go forward with this motion. Thank you. Okay, so what I would see then is just to be clear, this motion with regards to approving the specifications would approve the quota, the possession limits, and the date what that's to be determined yet at this time. Um, and then after we dispense of this motion, we could have discussion about the PDT, looking at seasons or any other ideas this board may have before it. So given that, is there any other discussion on this motion? Rob? Uh, the discussion has been very helpful, and I think that on the to be determined uh, can be optimistic for the moment and uh, would be able to support this motion. Okay, hearing that, um, is there any public comment on this motion? Seeing none, I'll give the board a moment to caucus. Okay. Uh, do you need the motion read again, Joe? All right. Uh, all those states in favor of the motion? Oh. Okay, we need, we're going to go with the roll call method again. Uh, I will go ahead as a final action and ask again if there are any objections to the motion as it is before us. Seeing none, are there any abstentions? Any null votes? Okay, seeing none, the motion passes unanimously without opposition. Thank you very much. Uh, Rob, would you like me to turn to you to continue the discussion about the seasonal measures and possibly tasking the PDT with action? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would, and I think that uh, if there can be different um, seasonal regimes that could be established based on the landings trends of the states, that would be the place to start. I know in particular for Virginia with the closure from May 1 to July 15th, it's obvious that after that time, um, even though earlier we have the distribution, we have the closure. So after that time, July 15th would be a window for Virginia. I think from talking to Lewis Daniel that there's a similarity there for North Carolina, but Tony has also talked to uh, Pardon me, Tony has also talked to Lewis Daniel and may have that information as well. Um, but I think based on recent information, you could probably configure uh, a few seasonal options that could be reviewed at a later meeting. From what I've heard in conversing with staff based on the way the FMP is right now, to ultimately achieve that, we would need to get to an addendum to accomplish that. At this stage, we could pass the PDT with coming back to us with a white paper or some other type of informational uh, that you could feed into that process, um, or you could go ahead and initiate an addendum addendum to go ahead with that and jump start that process. My guess is that whatever we're looking at, we're probably looking at 2015 at this point. Whether we get a white paper that comes back to us um, or an addendum isn't going to change that initiating either of those at, at February, I don't think. Um, so again, what would be the pleasure of the board? There's clearly a need here for at least some states. Uh, so what would you like to do? I think the two options before us are get a white paper back from the PDT that could spell out some of the options or have them start looking at drafting an addendum to bring back to us with those options. 
Rob? I think the white paper is the right place to start to have everyone aware of the possibilities. I think this has been a relatively quiet issue at the ASMSC in general, and then towards the 11th hour, there have been uh, there has been a little bit of commotion about all this. Um, the January 1 date is a sort of a perennial situation, but the other issues um, I think were, were fairly quiet from what I recall from past meetings. So it would be better, I think, to raise the awareness of maybe all the states of what the possibilities could be with the seasonality to the quota. Thank you. Tony? Rob? Would you also like the PDT to explore um, seasonal possession limits since that is one of the things that um, HMS has discussed using to ensure that the quota is um, stretched out throughout the year from the conversations that I have had with them? Bob? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Tony. And that was also one of our interests in Virginia. Um, and I think North Carolina, but I can't say for certain, but I think that would be a, a good approach and uh, it could possibly achieve the same desired result. And, and I mean adjustable possession limits, not seasonal. Yes. I apologize for misspeaking. I understood. Thank you. This discussion here today would be sufficient to get the PDT started on that without a formal motion. Uh, are there any other specific inputs any members of the board want to give at this point? Um, it certainly isn't a constraining time frame. It's an iterative, ongoing process. Um, but if, is there anything specific to go ahead and give the PDT more information right now? Okay, seeing none, are we comfortable staff that we've got enough information to have the T PDT bring something back to us at February is what we'd be looking at? Okay, so we'll have this board will have information about that in February. All right, uh, we'll next move on to our next agenda item, which is uh, Addendum 3, which is a up for final approval today. I'll turn to Marin uh, for a review of that addendum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is draft addendum three for final approval. I'm just going to quickly go over the options and give you a brief public comment summary. And I just wanted to mention that um, Lewis Gillingham couldn't make it, so I'll be giving the AP report. But I'll leave time between my presentation and that report for questions. So we are at the final stages of approving this document. So today you will review the options and select management measures and give it final approval. Just to um, remind you, no fisheries amendment 5A addressed the recent stock assessment findings for scalped hammerhead, black nose, and sandbar sharks. And in that rule, they established new species groupings and quotas for hammerhead and black nose sharks. And they also established a new recreational size limit for all hammerhead sharks. These um, measures were implemented July 3rd and August 2nd, so they are already in place in federal waters. Uh, a key goal of the Coastal Sharks FMP, as I remind you a lot, is to maintain consistency between NOAA fisheries and the ISFMP. And so these new species groups, quotas, and recreational size limit result in inconsistencies, and that's why this addendum was developed. And just some background, when NOAA fisheries opens or closes, federal waters for hammerhead sharks or black nose sharks, state waters follow suit. So removing the, um, the species from the species groups doesn't actually impact the FMP or the regulations as written. And so NOAA fisheries removed these species from their respective groups and just established uh, separate groups for them. And just some more background, uh, the current recreational size limit for hammerheads is 54 inches, and the stock assessment found that the female scalloped hammerhead shark reaches maturity at 78 inches. And so that new size limit would limit the retention of mature individuals. So issue one is to establish new species groups and quota. Option A is status quo. The commission will not change the species groupings in the ISFMP. And option B is to change the species groupings and quota to be consistent with um, the Highland Migratory Species Amendment 5A. 
Here would be the new uh, species groupings and linkages. And as I mentioned, hammerhead sharks would be removed from the large coastal shark species group and placed into their own separate species group. And then these two um, species groups would be linked, so whenever one closes, the other would also close. And the same with um, non-black nose, small coastal sharks, and black nose coast, uh, black nose sharks. Excuse me, they were already in separate quotas, but and they were already linked, but they will now be in their separate species groups. And issue two deals with the recreational size limit. Option A is status quo; the commission will not change the recreational size limit for hammerhead sharks. And option B is measures consistent with the amendment five A. Smooth hammerhead, scalloped hammerhead, and great hammerhead sharks will have a 78 inches fork length recreational size limit. All other recreational measures will remain the same. There were no public comments received on this addendum, and now I can take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Questions for Marin? Pete, and then Pat. Yes, Marin. Um, I think this is a no-brainer as to what we have to do, uh, but as far as uh, yeah, reshuffling the, uh, the sharks and the different groupings is 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 quite a chore when you when you have to change the regulations. And my only question is now that, and I think you just I just touched upon it, but it wasn't in the uh, in the addendum. Uh, so taking hammerheads out of the non-sandbar large coastal group. And in our current regulations, the large coastal group has that seasonal closure in state waters. The hammerheads are still subject to the, in, the state waters closure, are they not? Yes, they are. Okay, and, and then the same thing for the possession limit, whereas now it says uh, possession limit, large coastals. So now it would be large coastals and hammerheads combined. Yes, all the appropriate sections in the FMP would be changed to accommodate these new species groupings. Thank you. Pat. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mary, you did a great job. There's no question this will put us in line with where we should be, so we're consistent. And uh, it's kind of, as my old expression used to be, it's a no-brainer. So whenever you're ready for a motion, Mr. Chairman. I'll give the board another opportunity for comment or questions. Seeing none, uh, I do have a couple other reports to go through, Pat. I appreciate your enthusiasm, and we will put it to you shortly. Um, as Marin indicated, we didn't have any public comment for her to present. Uh, she does have an AP report for us. Marin? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I mentioned, this is the AP report. We held a conference call to discuss draft addendum three, and five AP members participated. There was a little bit of concern with the new quota linkage, as the AP indicated that when the black nose and non-black nose uh, species groups are linked, it results in an under-harvest of the non-black nose species group when the black nose species group closes. Although um, NOAA Fisheries was a uh, part of this call and they indicated that this has actually not happened in the past. So I did just want to point that out to the board. And issue two, uh, the recreational size limit, the AP didn't have any issues with this. Although some recreational fishermen felt that putting a size limit on the recreational fishery and not on the commercial fishery put them at a bit of a disadvantage. And that's all I have for the AP report. Thank you. Questions? Okay, seeing none, we have a TC report. Carolyn? Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mike's going to bring yep. up those slides from your presentation in just a moment. Okay, so the Technical Committee met on September 27th of 2013 to discuss uh, both the 2014 specs and draft addendum three. We also had a couple of other lesser um, importance items that we also discussed, one being the scientific uh, exhibit permits that are uh, issued to folks, how states are following up with those once you've issued them. So if you have a, a shark that's in an aquarium, who's responsible for ensuring what's going on with that specimen? Um, and that was, again, more of informational, finding out most states have different ways and mechanisms of dealing with it, or it's issued but it's not really monitored. So it was kind of more, again, discussion and information amongst the group. 
Um, and then the other item was discussion of the adoption of smooth hound um, as a swap for smooth dogfish within the FMP because obviously the animals, the vernaculars do have different connotations, but there was discussion about that uh, HMS had adopted the use of smooth hound as a complex in their amendment three, and as such our language was changed. But this, we did have discussion because Florida does have the presence of both smooth dogfish and smooth hound, but the ratio of which those two species species occur was low enough that Florida really didn't feel that the vernacular change was going to hurt them. So it, at that point, folks felt that it was okay to issue that smooth hound naming overall to include the two species. Um, so with regards to what happened with the draft addendum three, uh, if you go ahead and go to the next slide, there were seven of us on the phone call. Um, we didn't anticipate any issues as far as the options that are currently laid out. Um, and that in this particular situation, obviously the consistency would be key in the success for this, um, especially with these, these groupings. I mean, scalloped hammerheads, or hammerheads in general are obviously easy to identify. Um, and we recommended going ahead and adopting both um, options B and under issue one and issue two, which is the measures to be consistent with NOAA fisheries. And that's pretty much all of our discussions relative to that. And I'll take any questions that the group might have. Questions on the TC report? Mr. O'Reilly. Just a, a question about where things stand on the, I'll call it smooth, smooth hound, um, as far as the quota. And also, I know we're going forward in December to establish the um, fin to carcass ratio, and is there any idea where nymphs might end up on that since that isn't final yet? Is there anything that we'll know that we'll be coming back after we establish the 12 percent to 88 percent? Any ideas on that? Um, I'm not 100 percent sure, and I'm going to look to Marin to help me with that. We do know, obviously, that was part of where our question came up in the group was that when we looked at that 12 percent rule, it was relative to smooth dogfish. So the question was, would that ratio still apply in a smooth hound type category? And um, I think that, again, knowing that the, the proportion that are actually smooth dog, uh, it wasn't as big a concern for the group as we discussed it. But I don't really know where HMS is relative to the smooth dogfish. All right. Sorry, Rob, I was consulting with the chair when for a majority of your question. Could you please repeat it? Yes, uh, thank you, Marin. I was indicating that we're going forward with the 12% and to 88% after conferring with you earlier um, as to what needs to be in place by January 1. And I was wondering um, how firm that ratio is. Has there been any other discussion as to whether that might change? Uh, how does that look? I, I believe it's very firm. It's not looking like it's going to change. Any additional questions? All right, seeing none, uh, our next step then would be to take action on this. Uh, we have two issues in this addendum. Uh, we could take separate motions or combine them. Uh, we will then need to take final action on the addendum as a whole, and then we could have some discussion about implementation date. Mr. Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well done. Um, well, let's go forward with uh, an overall uh, motion. Tony, you going to put it up there for me, or do you want me to wordsmith? Uh, Mike, you have Pat's motion ready? I don't think yeah, that's at, it. We had originally had oh, yes. it from you, Pat, as two separate motions, if you'd like to move forward in that manner, we, or if you'd now like to combine it, that would be at your discretion. I'd like to combine it, Mr. Chairman. It's, uh, it's again, it's, quite frankly, it's a slam dunk. Things we are doing are in line with them, so let's keep it all unless someone really has a, a stomachache about it. I'll give Mike a minute to combine your motions for you. That's great. If I may read it, Mr. Chairman. Please do. Move to approve issue one, option B, measures consistent uh, with HMS Amendment 5A and approve issue two, option B. 
measure consistent with HMS Amendment 5A. Smooth hammerhead, scallop hammerhead, and great hammerhead sharks will have a 78-inch full-length um, recreational size limit. Well, full-length, I don't like that. All others have a recreational measures will remain the same. Full-length. I, I believe that was 78 inches fork-length. Fork-length, that's what I thought. Thank you. I was going to say I never thought of it that way. Uh, yes, I think that should be it. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second to that motion? Seconded by Mr. Himchak. Discussion on the motion? Is there any objection to the motion? Is there, are there any abstentions to the motion? Null votes. Uh, further, should the record reflect that we don't have any constituents from Maine here at the time? See? Okay. All right. The motion passes without objection. Uh, our next step then would be to go ahead and entertain a motion to approve the addendum with the options chosen here today. Mr. Augustine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do we have that up? Here it comes. Okay, Mr. Augustine, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Move to approve addendum three to the Coastal Sharks FMP as selected today. Motion by me. Thank you, Mr. Augustine. Second to the motion, Mr. Himchak. Is there any board discussion on this? Is there any additional comment from the public on this addendum? Seeing none, we'll now turn back to the board for a vote. This is a final action. Uh, in lieu of a roll call vote, I will ask if there is any objection to the approval of this addendum today. Seeing no objection, are there any abstentions? No abstentions. Any null votes? No null votes. The motion carries. Uh, the next order of business then would be to discuss the compliance schedule implementation date. Uh, in talking with staff here, January 1st, 2014 was a date that was suggested. Uh, would turn to the board for any state specific compliance issues that we may need to consider here today. Jim? We, we can um, do this as an emergency rulemaking in, in New York. However, um, you know, we, we, we have so many of them, I'm getting the attorneys really annoyed at me. So um, a typical rulemaking on a normal procedure will take three to six months. So um, it would be helpful, actually, if we had a little bit of latitude on that to say maybe March 1st or something, just so we can finish our process. But again, if it's not the pleasure of the board, we can get an emergency rule done by January 1st. Thank you. Maureen? So just to clarify to the board, I was under the impression that the states just followed um, the FMP and deferred to no fisheries. I wasn't aware that any states actually had to put out rulemaking. So if that's not the case, then, of course, we can move the date later in the season, but I just wanted to get some feedback on that first. So New York would have to have rulemaking for this? If I do a size change, I essentially have to do the rulemaking. So, yeah. Pete? Yeah, just, just a, a technical point. Because of the reshuffling of the, the species into all these different groups, uh, we have to do a rulemaking, but we, we can do it by notice of administrative change and have it done by January 1st, but uh, it took a lot of rewording because of, you know, as I, as essentially you're, you're reshuffling the deck. John Clark. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, similarly, we start the process immediately, but it would take a few months because we also have to go through the regulatory process. Rob O'Reilly. Thank you. Uh, March 1 would be good for Virginia, although we could do an emergency, would prefer not to. 
um, and it sounds like it may March one may be ambitious for some of the states. Well, I think one of the other hearing the conversation around the board here at this point, the changes to those state plans, I believe, would just need to come back to this board for approval. Um, would the February meeting be reasonable for the board to be able to see those state regulations at this point? I'm seeing nods of heads. I'm not seeing any waving hands indicating extreme opposition to that. Um, with that, then, if we do that in February, we could leave here today with a March 1st date, although I heard some comment about that, that they, that may be a little ambitious. Not seeing any op Rob. Uh, no, that was a shrug. Uh, <laughs> I was following up on John on his comments about uh, at least three months or something, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone March 1. Okay, uh, so we've got March 1 as a proposal before us uh, with the caveat also that those states that do need to chain, make changes will bring them back to the board for the February meeting. Marin? So the February board meeting is the first week in February and the PRT will need time to review those state plans so is a what would be a good date to have those state plans turned into staff? Does um, early January I know the holidays are coming up so January 5th Okay, great, thank you. Okay, do we need a specific motion on the implementation date at this point or just the record reflecting March 1st, 2014 sufficient? and getting nods of heads from staff. Uh, so we've got an implementation date for this addendum then of March 1st, 2014. Uh, states that are changing their plans will turn them into the PRT for review uh, on or about January 5th, 2014, and those will come before this board at the winter meeting. Okay, very good. Um, that concludes discussion on that item. Uh, there was no other business brought before this board. Uh, seeing none, Mr. Beal has a co I'll turn to Mr. Adler first, then I'll come back to you, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to bring this thing back up. I, I know I'm repetitive uh, on dogfish. Uh, and when I looked at my notes of some of the comments that came from the fishermen, uh, it said that uh, the, the Federal National Marine Fisheries Service has not been doing anything. And I wanted to ask and see if uh, the representatives from NOAA here um, can indicate that they've done anything on that dogfish problem we talked about earlier, and I'm not going back into the, the whole story. Uh, do they have any comment on anything that they're trying to do to improve the market thing? Well, the specific problem you're referring to is the markets. Okay, you know, obviously the biggest factor that caused the loss of those markets was the reduction in quota previously. Thankfully, we're going in the other direction at this point. Mike, I saw you come forward. Did you want to respond at all to that, to markets? Or, yes? Um, yeah, I mean, in, you know, I can try to respond to the question. Um, we have been requested to um, write a letter of support. Um, there, was, there has been some attempts and some conversations between industry uh, and, and members of Congress and others about um, having dogfish added to a, I believe it's a, a US, um, USDA um, category of food products that can be um, supported and used in schools and other institutional um, food service uh, industries. And we have been requested, we the agency have been requested to write a letter of support for that program. That is still under um, discussion and consideration. We have no, issued no final decision on that, but we are looking into it. 
uh, that, Mr. Chairman, if I yeah, may, Bill, go ahead. Um, that, that would be good. Uh, and I think it ought to be put out from NOAA that they're trying to do something about it and not just the fishermen have the feeling they just, you don't care about us. Uh, and I, I, I see you're trying to do, but you do have restraints as to what you can do. I mean, you can't go call up Europe and go, hey, take them. But uh, uh, at the same time, if you could somehow in the uh, put out something uh, to the fishing industry showing that you are doing whatever you can to help the situation, that would be, I think, very helpful. Thank you. Mike Petney responds once more, then I'll go to the audience for a comment as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, keep in mind that there is an issue with, um, you know, PCB levels that have been found in the fish that have been exported to um, the EU. And so we do have to be somewhat sensitive about taking uh, agency positions on, on food products that um, may or may not have uh, PCB issues. Comment from the audience? For the record, state your name, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've been a lifelong commercial fisherman. I'm, my name is Raymond Kane, and I also work as an outreach coordinator for the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance. And uh, dogfish, as you all know, is prevalent off the waters of New England. I know for Bill's fleet, it, it, it's a money value fish, and for the fleets on Cape Cod, our organization took it upon ourselves to do testing. We sent 12 samples out, very expensive, $700 per sample. 12 samples passed U.S. standards. Nine of the 12 passed the Euro standards. By the way, the standards on dogfish were dropped in the Euro from 150 to 75. Meanwhile, salmon has stayed the same. Our organization is working with the processors and with academia to try to establish a market within this country and to bring back the market. And we feel it's been lost in Europe. The uh, bellies themselves, years ago when we were cut back to 4 million pounds, they substituted dogfish bellies with uh, salmon bellies. And the younger generation, as Pete spoke to earlier in Germany, in the beer gardens, they enjoy the salmon bellies. But we are moving forward with this, and I would appreciate this commission going home and not talking about the PCBs, but talking about another fish product which is edible and perishable. And as I said, it passed, every sample passed U.S. standards, and nine of the 12 in Europe. And I hate to inform Patsy, but it was Italy that keeps red flag and dogfish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond. Obviously, the loss of the EU market due to that is something that our fishermen, with the help of ourselves and our government, are going to have to continue to overcome. Um, and I hope we can all continue to work together to find solutions to that. Any other business to come before this board? Uh, before entertaining a motion to adjourn, Bob? Yeah, just a couple of housekeeping or scheduling issues. I think we, I don't, I don't see a need to have the policy board or business session later this afternoon. And during that meeting is when we usually read the uh, resolution thanking the host state for the annual meeting. And David Simpson has that wording now, and um, so it might be a good time to read it. Um, and then following that, I would since. You did such a good job, Mr. Chairman. You got everybody ahead of schedule. I'd, I'd you know, suggest a half an hour or so break for everybody to check out, get organized, and come back and, and start a horseshoe crab you know, around 10 o'clock or so, if that seems amenable to everybody here. Well, I was hoping that we were going to implement a rollover policy for time and we could bank this for future meetings. <laughs> if you keep track of it, it's all yours. <laughs> Uh, with that, we'll turn to Dave Simpson for resolution. All right. Um, up front, I want to thank uh, the other committee members, Bernie uh, Pankowski and Steve Train, and especially uh, Tina and Laura for, for all their help. Um, so here we are. 
Where, uh, whereas the 72nd annual meeting of the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission was conducted on the breathtakingly beautiful St. Simons Island, which provided a spectacular backdrop for the commissioners, management and science, law enforcement, habitat, coastal Atlantic Coast habit, Fish Habitat Partnership members, and the commission staff to tackle issues of mutual concern. And whereas the weather could not have been more perfect, no hurricane spud, we appreciated that, and provided uh, the northerners with a few more delightful warm days that we were not expecting to experience again until next spring. So I really enjoyed that myself. Uh, and whereas the opening reception was a lovely affair held in the St. Simon's Casino, where some commissioners were seen wandering about in search of slot machines, <laughs> And whereas uh, Melissa Laser um, ACFHP award was presented at the reception to a most deserving Bill Goldsboro, uh, honoring his steadfast commitment to habitat for more than two decades. And whereas the 22nd annual Laura Leach fishing tournament provided anglers the opportunity to land an array of species from Bernie Panguit's Bull Red uh, to Tony, uh, to Roy Miller's surprisingly impressive Bay Anchovy. <laughs> and whereas the staff of the Coastal Resources Division pulled out all the stops and not only fed us an amazing southern, uh, fed us amazing southern food, beginning with an endless oyster roast, moving on to fried, shri uh, fr fried shrimp, cheese grits, and collards, y'all, and ending with an endless um, sky of majestic color and great and a great band to boogie to, and the most beautiful porta potties where several women were overheard extolling their virtues. And whereas the 23rd annual David H. Hart recognized Richie White uh, for his unwavering commitment to successful management of marine fisheries along the Atlantic coast, and whereas everyone at the meeting had such a great time to such an extent that when one state director was asked about his plans for an upcoming annual meeting uh, in his state, he replied, we're having our next meeting in Georgia. Um, and now, therefore, be it resolved that the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission expresses it, its deep appreciation to Georgia's commissioners, uh, Spud Woodward, John Burns, Nancy Addison, and especially Pat Gear. Uh, Nancy Butler, Tammy Gain, and Doug Hamans for their exceptional assistance in the planning and conduct of this outstanding 72nd annual meeting. We'll all leave with Georgia on our minds. Wow. Thank you, Dave, and the Resolutions Committee for that very fitting Resolution. Spud? Um, I'm glad that the uh, restrooms made the uh, resolution because you know, we, uh, we struggled, but we, fought, we felt it was particularly important for folks that had never been to this part of the world to realize that we don't all use little wooden shacks with crescent moons on the, uh, on the door as restrooms. And so uh, we, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, that's a very important part of any social function. So, uh, so we, were, we were pleased to do that. And we were very glad to have you all here and for the blessing of wonderful weather. And, and we hope that uh, you will leave with Georgia on your mind and come back. And if you ever have interest in coming back, just let us know and we'll do our best to roll out the same carpet for you. Thank you, Spud. All right, any other business? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Pat, seconded by Mr. Adler. This board is adjourned. Uh, horseshoe crabs at 10 o'clock, Bob? Yes, please.